Well, praise God. I have to tell you that if you if you happen to show up on this Wednesday night and you've never been before, that we've been studying the book of Revelation. Revel the book of Revelation is probably one of my favorite books. Uh, it was the first book that I ever read. I don't really know why. I was on a work boat out in the Gulf of Mexico, and I had just gotten saved. And Anyway, it was the first book that I read through. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, 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 I've always loved the book of Revelation. i got to tell you that there's a lot of believers that, that don't really all, you know, they're not all in, you know. But they, oh, well, I don't understand that. It's kind of hard to understand. So, so they kind of like leave it on the back burner. And I kind of understand that. I do. But I've, I've got to tell you that the book of Revelation is extremely important. And listen, where we are in this book is we're, we're at the point now where God is pouring his wrath out on humanity. Okay, now what you got to what you need to understand is if you're a Christian tonight, you know, then then you don't have to face God's wrath. It's important that you understand that if you're a born again believer. Well, what does it mean to be born again? Well, I tried to lead you through a prayer if you were watching on video whenever I said that you got to come to the realization that you're a sinner and you need a savior. See, if nobody ever tells you that you're a sinner, if nobody ever tells you that you were born of Adam and, and Adam was the first creation of God, uh, the first the first human being that was created. That's what the Bible says. You know, I got a lot of science. I've taken a lot of science classes. I'm a nurse practitioner. I was I'm an RN. I got a lot of education. But can I tell you something? The science to me, after what God's done in my heart, it needs to line up with the word of God. It is not the other way around. Okay. I've seen what God has done in my life. And whenever I was just a simple person that didn't understand anything about God and I was broken and separated from the Lord and I was far away, God was merciful and kind enough to reveal his love to me. Amen. And I'm so grateful that in the midst of my brokenness, I was willing to bow my knee and give my heart to the Lord. Because there's a lot of people that are going to live on earth that won't bow their knee to the Lord. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is for those people. It's, it's for the people that are going to refuse, if you will, to give their heart to the Lord. Okay. One of the things that I want you to understand is, is that God has been very merciful. And whenever he, God has been very merciful since the fall of man. He has had a witness in the land. He's had a witness on the earth. What are you talking about? Somebody to tell somebody about God. He's always had a witness. A lot of times God's own people are ashamed of him. But when they were singing that song about Jesus, I love Jesus. They kept saying the name Jesus. Jesus. See, I don't know how that makes you feel right now. Jesus. I can remember when I was riding in a car with my future wife and she was listening to Christian music on the radio and I'm coming out the world used to listening going to rock and roll concerts and ZZ Top Van Halen and going to all these different rock and roll concerts and 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 even though I had gotten saved I'm telling you there was something in me that I didn't like as many times as these people were talking about Jesus but I'm here to tell you that I'm so glad I love the name Jesus I'm, I'm here to tell you, it might seem weird to you at first, but the name of Jesus, he's the lover of your soul. I, can, I wish that passion could get it through. I wish that I could talk you into something, but I can't. It's got to be the Holy Spirit that reveals the goodness of God and how right. good Jesus is. And if you would give your heart to the Lord, I'm telling you, he will move in and he will do a work. On the inside, but there's going to be people that are going to refuse to hear the word of the Lord. And that's the parts we're going to talk about it a little bit tonight. That's the parts of the gospel that are bitter. That's the parts of the gospel. Oh, but it's still sweet to the one who loves God. Messenger, even though God told people about his love and his goodness, they refuse to receive. Mm. And because they refuse to receive, there's coming a day on the earth when grace is going to run out. Amen. And it's going to go from being grace to wrath. And wrath is a forceful anger. God never wanted to destroy man. God never wanted to. The Bible even says it. He said, go to the place of hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what hell was prepared for. Not human beings. It was prepared for the fallen angels that rebelled against God. But yet there are human beings that will also rebel against God. Now listen. Before we even get into this chapter real good, I want you to know some things. I want you to know that, that God is good. Amen. Yes. And, that, and that God had a loving plan. 
when, when we hear the, some of the words of the songs that we that we were singing, one of the things that really touched me while we were singing, I don't even really, really remember which one it was. I just was thinking about how God, maybe it was, oh, how he loves us. And, and I was thinking about how God, and, and, and listen, that, that, that verse in that song about the kiss, dude, you swear that, that verse right there and then split churches before. Okay, because the, the guy that wrote it put like a wet sloppy kiss. Yeah. And then David Crowder changed it to a passionate kiss. And can I tell you that, and I'm not going to sit here and try to figure it all out because I don't know everything. I can tell you that right now. But to me, I like the concept <coughs> of kiss as I was singing it, but it's really more about like a fatherly kiss. If you want to know the truth, <coughs> but you know what the problem is? Let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is, is most of us, our fathers are jacked up. Right? I mean, if we're honest. Now, we got some good people in here. I can look and I can tell, no, y'all some good daddies. And y'all keep up the good, by the grace of God, y'all keep up the good work. And y'all keep y'all keep loving on your children. Amen. But I can tell you right now that if somebody would have told me that God met earth like a fatherly kiss, I would say, let me tell you something, boss. My daddy ain't never put his lips on me. And if I had tried to put my lips on him, it'd been ugly. You hear me? But what I'm trying to say is this. Is that a father that loves his children, That's amen, right. Right. and is, has concern for his children. Yeah. I can imagine, I can imagine, even my dad, because he didn't know any better, but I can imagine my daddy grabbing me out of the face, had, had the Lord touch his heart, yeah. and giving me a kiss on my forehead, and letting me know it was going to be all right, and letting me know that he loved me, amen. Yeah. I got to tell you that that heaven, listen to me, I, I can't, I don't even know if I'm going to get to pray, heaven <laughs> met earth like a, some kind of a wonderful kiss. I can guarantee you right now it wasn't romantic. <laughs> it wasn't, that wasn't the kind of love it was. That's not the kind of love it was. It was a concerning love. It was a caring love. Listen, our mind's all twisted up. The word eros in the Greek is not even in the Bible where we get the word erotic from. There's a whole lot of words for love, but eros is not one of them. Yet our mind is tainted, and, that, and that's how we think. But look, I want you to know, no, that's good. Heaven met earth. <clears throat> I'm just going to say it. I'm, I'm not rewriting the song like a fatherly kiss. Oh, God wants you to know how much he loves you. And yeah. you know how he met earth? He sent Jesus. Oh, listen, this is good. This, this is some deep theology. He sent Jesus to die on the cross, to bear your sin, to bear my sin, because born in Adam, we were all born sinners. Jesus came to earth so that you and I could be born again. You hear me? And, and whenever Jesus died and we put faith in that, we became born again. If you're a Christian today, you're born again. I used to tell people about the Lord all the time. Oh, so you're a Christian. I'm, yeah, I'm a Christian. I just ain't one of them born again. Ones. Well, brother, we got a problem. Because the word of God said, Jesus said, that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, nor will he enter into the kingdom of God. So, so that's how heaven met earth. Heaven met earth when God sent his only begotten son, hallelujah, to die on the cross. And good news, good news, if you'll receive him as your Lord and Savior, guess what? You can enter into his presence. Where there's grace, and where there's love, and where there's hope. And you can hold on to him, and I guarantee you, he will get you through anything you face Amen. on this earth. Right. And there's a whole lot better on the other side. You've got to just trust me on that. Amen. Amen? Until we continue to learn together. Amen? All right, let's read. Revelation 10. So we talked about the love of God already. We've talked about the grace of God. But again, we're in the middle of the book of Revelation and the wrath of God is being poured out. And I got to tell you that you walked into what I would consider a little bit of an advanced class. In, in, in prophetic, what we'll call it prophetic literature. This is, not, this is not 101. I would not call this 101. I would call this, a, we're, we're, at a, we're at a junior level class. But guess what? You're going to get something. I promise you, if you listen and listen with ears open and a heart that's open, you will receive something from it. Amen? All right. Good news, though, is if you get saved, you don't have to face the wrath of God. But one of the things that I've learned, and this is some fancy words, is something called the hermeneutical circle. Okay, what does that mean? All of the Bible helps you to understand understand parts of the Bible and to understand parts of the Bible helps you to understand the whole of the Bible. So what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say you can't leave any stone uncovered. Even if you don't like a certain passage, you're still supposed to read it and pray for wisdom and more here. You got to start, we got to start digging and we got to start looking a little bit. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and read it. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven 
clothed with a cloud. Now, you, I want you to pay attention. We're going to break it down a little bit how, they, how this angel is described. Okay, so he's clothed with a cloud. And, and, you know, some of you advanced students, some, some of these words, some of these adjectives that are describing these, this angel, already some things ought to at least start being around in your, in your brain from things that you've read and studied in the past. So he, he, this angel is clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are. You know, look, let's just stop for a second right there because if you don't believe that, it, it, I'm serious. Now think about it. If you don't believe that, then this whole thing's done got comical. If you do not believe that there is a God in heaven that spoke the worlds into existence because carbon-14 data says that dinosaurs existed 300 million years ago and therefore this earth and this creation story can't be real. I got You, you, just, soon, you just soon cry out to God and ask him to change your heart. Amen. Because I got to tell you something. Listen, if, if this word is true, and I believe that it is. Amen. I'm convinced it is. If this word is true and in the word of God says, let God be true and every man be a liar. Then that means, is it possible that science could even be lying? Come on, somebody. Why would science lie? Do you realize what would happen to this world if scientists began to come out the closet, so to speak, and began to admit that they were finding more and more things? And listen, I don't mean to get all fancy on you, but things like the Krebs cycle. Have you ever, did you learn about the Krebs cycle and the production of energy within a human body and how it so closely correlates the concept of a combustion engine and how even scientists are starting to say that they believe in intelligent design because they know they're not, they're not stupid. They're smart, they, but, but the, it's the unthinkable. What they got to do is this, they got to. They're going to have to bow their knee to come. And, and they're having a hard time with all that pride and that intelligence to bow their knee to say. And then they're going to get ostracized because most of their partners that, that, that are practicing in the fields of science are not. And so what they're going to do is, is that, you know, they're going to be shunned. I'm here to tell you right now that if you got a problem with creation, you already got a problem in the story. But I'm here to tell you that I believe with all of my heart. I don't know how he did it, but he did a little thing in this thing right here. In this heart right here, I'm telling you, he changed. When the time, time as we know it is coming to an end. We're going to try to break that down a little bit. You know, th th there's been a lot of different time frames in the economy of God, if you could say, in the chronology of God, if I could say it that way. There was a time before the fall. We don't even know how long that lasted. And then there was a time from Abraham to the nation of Israel and, and the giving of the law. And then there was a time from there until Jesus came. And since Jesus, we've been living in a time frame of the church age. But one day God is going to bring the time as we know it to an end. Hallelujah. And then the Bible says there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. The Bible says that there's going to be a thousand year reign of Jesus. Listen, a lot of people don't believe in God right now. A lot of people don't believe in Jesus right now. They make little memes and funny stuff about the Lord, you know, and, and, and they say all these funny little things. But let me tell you something. One day, ain't going to be no laughter over that. There's not going to be any joking over that. They're going to know. The Lord will reveal himself and then they're going to know whenever they see him come, they're going to know. So it says, time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, I want you to see that. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as, as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. All right, so we're in the trumpets. All right, look, real quick, let me give you a little rewind. Let me give you a, a little quick review. The first three chapters talk about the specific churches 
then then we come into the seals that the seals were not the wrath of God. We, we described that. It was the time of tribulation. And we made the point that man can create tribulation. I gave you many, many examples of how man, man already creates tribulation. Does he not? I mean, come on. You know, we already talked about it. Famine, right? I don't have time to get into it, but if you just watch some things, I don't even know what part of the continent of Africa it is, but I've seen certain documentaries where they indentured their own people into slavery and they stick them in diamond mines or whatever. And whenever these kids try to run away or they find that they stick diamonds in their pocket, they cut their arm off with a machete. Dude, that's straight up tribulation. Now you want, I mean, I'm not making fun, but you know, sometimes I get goofy. Now you walk around with a nub. And it wasn't, none of it was your fault. You were just born in the wrong place at the wrong time. And they turned you into a slave. And you were trying to break out. Yeah, you, you stole, but you stole from some wicked, horrible people. That's mankind. Yes, it's evil working through man. But it's evil through man causing tribulation. Just like powerful people can tell ships to quit coming into port. We've already talked about that. And tell... The truckers to quit driving and to tell shelves on the grocery store to quit being filled. That would be tribulation. I mean, you saw what happened with Corona and toilet paper. Could you imagine if there was no food? Right? And so you can see how, tri so that was the seals and that's tribulation. But then see seal number seven opened up trumpet number one. And now we're in the trumpets, and that's the wrath of God. And what I want you to see though, as we move forward, and tonight I'm going to make a point, is that I'm seeing a I'm seeing that the trump that the trumpets, this may be new for some of you, and some of you might not have even thought about this that much, that the trumpets and the and the trumpets and the vials are happening concurrently. Meaning it's not the seals, then seven trumpets, then seven vials. That instead it's seven seals, and then we see the rapture. At least I believe that's when we see the rapture. And then what happens after that is you see a trumpet and a vial, trumpet and a vial. And those are happening at the, around the same time. And we're going to try to break that up down for you today. Okay, but I just want you to know the difference between tribulation and wrath. Wrath is from God. When the trumpet starts blowing and God starts breathing. Now, this is after the rapture of the church. What's the rapture of the church? The rapture of the church is when God calls his people home. What are, you, what are you saying? I'm saying that there's going to be a time when gravity for God's people is going to lose its hold. That's what the Word of God says. Might sound like a sci-fi movie, but I'm here to tell you that the Bible says in the letter to the Thessalonians that the dead in Christ will rise first. They're going to pop up out the grave. Then we who are alive and remain will go to meet him in the air. And there we shall be with the Lord forevermore. Comfort one another with these words. Like you, gotta, you need to be comforted. You need to understand that you're not always going to be living on this fallen earth. Amen. You don't always have to be knee deep in chaos and pain and heartache and sorrow. And even now, if you'll give your heart to the Lord and surrender to him, guess what? He'll give you the peace that you need to make it to that great day. I believe that. Amen. And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke unto me again and said, Go and take the little book. So the angel had a book in his hand, which is open in the hand of the angel, which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make your belly bitter. You ever had a bitter belly? I think I'm going to preach a message one time on bit, uh, the bitter belly. But it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. And I think some things when the adjectives of this angel were being spoken of. In Revelation chapter 10, it said that this mighty angel was clothed with a cloud and had a rainbow. When you think of the cloud, now I automatically thought about Revelation 1 7, so I'll put it up here to compare it. We're going to talk about it. Am I saying that this angel is Jesus? Absolutely not, because there's no definite proof. I'm trying to show you the similarities. Between other passages that connected to Jesus. Now let me make this. But I do want to make this point clear. That in the Old Testament. There are many times that the angel of Yahweh. Or the angel of God. Is an obvious. In my opinion. Or my understanding. 
Christophany. What does that mean? That means Jesus showed up in the Old Testament in the form of, of an angel or whatever it was. They call it an angel. You got to understand that sometimes our understanding of what's going on in the spiritual realm, we don't understand it. But we understand the word angel, right? But in the Greek, the word angel simply means a messenger. So I want you to know, though, that Jesus was not an angel. Because and the reason why I think it's important you understand that is because, number one, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus is the incarnation of the Archangel Michael. That's a lie. Jesus did not come to earth to die. Jesus came to earth to die for fallen man. Jesus is God and he was incarnated. He became flesh. I want you to know that. And also the Mormons, they say that Jesus and Satan or Lucifer were brothers. So they basically saying that Jesus was an angel and he was the eternal word of God and he's the eternal son of God. But yet he was manifest in the Old Testament and many of these adjectives are describing what I would say sounds like Jesus. But again, the Bible right here, this is all speculation, so we're not going to spend too much time. All right? So I saw another angel. He was clothed with a cloud. Revelation 10.1. Revelation 1.7. Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. This one here says that this is whenever Jesus took John and, and, and James and Peter and Andrew up on the upon the mountain and he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun. And look at this one. The angel again. Mighty angel down from heaven. He was clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head and his face was as it were the sun. His feet in Revelation 115 talking about Jesus are likened unto fine brass as if they had been burned in a furnace and in the rep the passage we just read it says that his feet were as pillars of fire so I just wanted you to see that now we're jumping and we're shifting gears okay we're going to the Old Testament and I wanted you to see that there's a connection between Ezekiel the prophet Ezekiel so you understand that the prophet Ezekiel was approximately 600 years or so before Jesus was ever born, all right? And he's writing to the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, really, if you, I mean, for me, for if you've ever been a preacher, and or if you are, you, you feel like you've been called to preach the gospel or to teach the Bible. For me, when I read Ezekiel chapter 2 and Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm telling you right now, it ministers to my heart. And shows me in those chapters is what in his eyes a preacher is supposed to look like. Now you may not agree with that. But I'm talking about the words that come out of the preacher's mouth. And the Lord, if you go back and read that as homework, read Ezekiel chapter two and Ezekiel chapter three, I'm gonna tell you right now, what the Lord said to Ezekiel don't look like preachers today. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you right, I'm just telling you what I what I see. What the Lord said to Ezekiel does not sound like preachers today. Because the word of the Lord said that in the end, that there were going to be demonic spirits that were going to lead and guide preachers. And that they were going to preach messages that were going to tickle people's ears or tell them pleasant words. And that the people were going to love to hear those kinds of words. And that they were going to make piles of themselves of their favorite preachers that told them pleasant words. And the Lord told Ezekiel, listen, I'm sending you to, to people that are not going to receive what I'm telling you. But you say what I tell you to say. Amen. And so to me, it's encouraging. And, and, and you know what it encourages me also? Whenever y'all keep showing up. Because I know that some of the things that are said are kind of bitter. And as a matter of fact, that's an interesting thing because it talked about that book that was sweet like honey, but yet it turned bitter. All right. So here's the connection. This is the Revelation 10 to it says he had a book in his hand and a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. So it says right here in Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book, a, poor, a scroll and a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations, mourning, and woe. So when we, when we studied Revelation a couple of weeks back, or even last week, you remember I said, whoa, 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 the angel said, whoa, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah. 
And you know what the word woe means? It means great grieving. And the word lamentations describes crying, sorrow, right? And so Ezekiel saying that this book that was given to him contained within it lamentations and mourning and woe. And then we compare it back to Revelation 10, what we just said, and you see the highlighted portions. He said, it's going to make your belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. I got I to gotta tell you that the word of the Lord is sweet like honey. But some portions of the word of God are very corrective in nature and they can result in a feeling of bitterness. And they're definitely going to result in bitterness for people that reject the word of God. It's going to cause a lot of people's bellies to be bitter, right? All right. So here Ezekiel says unto me, look, look at the connection. I want you to see there's obviously some kind of a connection here. It can't just be accidental. <clears throat> and he said unto me, son of man. Cause your belly to eat and fill your bowels with this roll that I give you. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. You see the same exact terminology that was used in this other verse that we got from Revelation. Look at this. In, the, in Revelation 10, 9, it says it. In your mouth, sweet as honey. And so we see this connection between the two. Now there's also a connection between Daniel and in Revelation, all right? And so I want you to see this. So it says in, in, in Revelation 10, 4, it's talking about, it's telling him, John, to seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered. I, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you have to kind of be like me and be like, I don't understand, Lord, why would you even put this in here? You, you've told us so much. Anybody that's really studied the book of Revelation and has gained understanding about end time things every time you get a little nugget you probably get pretty excited i think if you're spending time studying the book of revelation because it's almost like it's it's like a puzzle that's being unlocked in your heart and in your mind you know daniel did not understand near what most people understand today daniel had some major revelation he was given vision but the the book of revelation added increased understanding to the book of daniel Amen. In the book of Daniel, now that we have the book of Revelation, the same thing. But what I'm trying to say is, it's like, Lord, we're over here studying, and you, sit, and you sent some thunders to speak something, but you wouldn't let him write it. Well, look at the Daniel passage. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And so there's some things that we still aren't going to know on this side of glory. And I, 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 hopefully you're okay with that. I know that I've come to grips with the fact that no matter how hard I study, no matter how many other preachers I listen to and learn from and pray and read, I'm not going to know everything on this side. You know, I, that doesn't mean I shouldn't try. Hey Amen. I should try. I should try to learn the word of God the best that I can. Okay. But God told Daniel that there's some things that are sealed up. And even in the very end, there's still some things that we're not going to understand completely. I want you to see this connection too, though. Daniel said he looked, and on the one, there was one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. So, listen, I'm not trying to say in the other passages, the angel, and he's got one hand on the earth, I mean one foot on the earth, and he's got one foot on the sea. But in this particular passage, there was two angels, and one was on one side of the bank of the river, and the other was on the other side. And you see that the same angel, he has it, and his foot is on the sea, and his foot is also on the earth. And these passages are showing a lot of similarities, in my opinion. Now, it says right here, we just read it in Revelation 10, 6. And swear by him that lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. And so the point that I made when we read that was that someday the end of this age as we know it is going to stop. And that's, that's what I definitely believe that this is talking about. We don't know what, if there's even going to be time. Time is something that I'm pretty sure we created to, to keep track of what time the sun's going to come up, what time the sun's going to go down. And so we can keep track of how many days we've been on the earth and all of these other things. 
But, you know, God doesn't keep time the way that we do. Amen? And so there's coming a day when there's not going to be time any longer. Amen? And look, at this is, this is, and look, but I want you to see this connection here because, again, this Daniel 12 chapter is definitely, let me just let the cat out the bag because you need to go back and read the whole chapter to understand it better. But the whole chapter 12 of Daniel, the whole book of Daniel, like really from the midpoint moving forward, is really talking about what's going to happen to the nation of Israel in the end of days. Okay, and it's talking about the end of the days, right? And so some of this information here is connected since it's talking about what's going to happen to Israel in the end of days. Then what it's doing is it's giving us information about what's going to happen in the end of days. Does that make sense? In the end of the earth, in the end of the world, in time events. All right. So he says, and I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. That passage right there gives me the idea, really, that we're talking about Jesus. I can, can you prove it? No. But this is, I was trying to describe to you earlier, a Christophany. When, when you know that God talks about certain things and he puts certain information in the Bible and he, and he puts it in the Old Testament, then he puts it in the New Testament. And then when you see something in the New Testament and it reminds you of something here, you got to imagine in your mind that it's not an accident. Now, you can't, again, some things we can't prove, but just the concept of the fact that he's dressed in linen gives me the idea and reminds me of Jesus. And let me tell you why. Because linen is a type of cloth that is associated with purity. Amen. And, and Jesus is associated with purity and sinlessness. All right. So the man was clothed in linen that was upon the waters of the river. Not only that, how many people you saw walking on water? Amen. I know this, this, is, a, this is a spiritual being, but I'm just trying to make a point. And when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, swear by him that lives forever that it shall be for a time, time, and a half. Does anybody remember what that means? Three and a half years. Thank you. So we've talked about that a lot. Did we not? If you're, if this is new information, let me just make a point that in the end of the age, the last, the last seven year period is broken up in the book of Revelation in a lot of different ways. 1260 days, uh, three, three, 3.5 years. The, I'm talking about seven year period, 1260 days. 3.5 years, which is half of a seven year period. 1260 days is 3.5 years and half of a seven year period. 42 months, according to a Jewish calendar, is 3.5 years, which is half of a seven year period. And then the times, half a time. One, I don't think I can do it. Two, that sounds weird with my people. And then 3.5. Okay, there you go. 3.5. 3.5 years. Time, times, and half a time. I just wanted you to see that, all right? And he says at the end of this, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. If you went back and you studied the book of Daniel, and especially when we got into Daniel chapter 9, we would begin to realize about this last seven-year period. And the angel told, told Daniel, there's some things that are determined upon your people. And part of what was determined on the people of God, known as Israel, was that there was coming a time when all of this bad stuff that was happening to them was going to come to an end. And what this is saying is, is that there's a specific time. So we get a connection to three and a half years. I want you to see that in the book of Daniel. This was written approximately, again, 500 or so years B.C., 500 B.C., 500 years before Jesus was born. The prophet Daniel was talking about a 3.5 year period and a connected to that period of time. Then all these things, the, the, the things that they're in are and the earth. That we, you know, that this was a lot of information and I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be a good boy, but I want but I want you to see something. That, first of all, I want you to see the word seventh angel, because that's a big thing. See, in the voice of the seventh angel, all right, and right now we're talking about the trumpets connected to the angel, right? And, and the seventh angel is blowing, the se he's going to blow the seventh trumpet. When he shall begin to sound, the sound of a trumpet, the mystery of God shall be finished. Now, that's why I think that it's important for us to at least entertain the idea that the vials... 
and the trumpets are not completely separated from one another. All right. And, and, and at least you can entertain this idea. And I'm going to show you some connections here in a moment. Um, and, and then, you, you know, you'll do what you desire to do with it after that. And you'll study it a little bit more because that's what we're supposed to do. Amen. But if the seven year, if the seven trumpets were in the middle, right? Because we said there were seven seals. And then we, I, I put in there that I said the rapture takes place after this, out between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. And then the seventh seal opens the first trumpet. And then if we're saying that the trumpets are in the middle and then the vials are in the end, then at least we have to admit that the trumpets and the vials are a shorter period of time than what the, than what the seals were, right? Because the first three and a half years was where the seals were. And then the last three and a half years would have to be where the vials and the trumpets are. Okay, that, that's number one. That doesn't mean that that's impossible. That could be the case, all right? But what I want you to see here is that it's specifically stating that the end of time or the mystery of God, let's say it like that, the mystery of God will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets, Talking about, to, I mean, definitely I believe it has to do with what Daniel just said about 3.5 years. Okay, that that will begin to happen when he begins to sound the seventh trumpet. So what I am trying to say is, is this, is that if the trumpets are concurrently taking place at the same time as the vials, then they start around the same time and they end around the same time. And so therefore the seventh trumpet would begin to signal the very end of that time frame. Hopefully that makes some sense. All right. And so it says, but now I want to talk to you a little bit more about the mystery. Because you see what it says? When the seventh trumpet sounds, then the mystery. Now listen, the mystery of God will be finished. There's a lot of mysteries spoken of in the New Testament. There's the mystery of Christ. There's, there, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of mysteries. But look. In Romans, it talks specifically about the Jewish people. And that's what we're talking about right now. We just talked about how Daniel said at that 3.5 year period that that was going to be the end of all of these things that were happening to God's people. Does that make sense? And in Revelation 10, he's saying that when that last trumpet begins to sound, that's going to be the end of time as we know it. Now, Romans is a part to the letter to the Romans. I love the book of Romans. It's my favorite book. And I'm a long way from it, but I prayed one time, Lord, make me an expert on Romans. I got a long way to go, but I've learned a lot. And one thing that I know about chapter 11 in the book of Romans is that Paul begins to address in chapter 10, really, really probably nine. Yeah, nine. He begins to address the Jewish people that were in the church. All right. So he's explaining to them now. But this is very important for us about end time events because God is not done with it. If you, turn on a, if you turn on a preacher that tells you that the church replaced Israel, that's not true. God, we don't, I don't believe in replacement theology. Okay, God is not done with the nation of Israel. Now, we can sit here and we can argue about what we got going on today in the world and it, what Israel really is and what Israel really isn't. But God isn't done with the nation of Israel. Amen. And so it says right here, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So tell us about the mystery, Paul, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now, one of the things that we're going to know, so he's basically saying that the, that the Israelites are blinded right now. Now, not all of them. Right. Because there's people that have ministries that specifically preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to Jewish people and these Jewish people get saved. And so they're not they're no longer blind. Their eyes are now open to who Messiah is. Amen. But there's a lot of Jewish people that are blinded. And, and Paul even talked about that because, see, they refuse to believe. And part of the reason is because God already told even through Jesus, we knew that the gospel was supposed to go to the Jews first, to the Israelites first, right? And then they were going to reject it. That's what all those parables about the fig tree and the, the wedding parable in Matthew 22. All that has to do with the Jewish people rejecting the gospel. And then now we see Paul come on the scene and he begins to preach the gospel to the, to the Gentiles. Okay, that's the book of Acts. And we'll get back around there sooner or later if you stick out with us. Hang out with us, all right? But look, this mystery that it's talking about is partly, it's in place. Why? 
blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now, I used to like the way this was, this was proposed, is that whenever you connect the end time, right? We've already, we've already made this comment before. Let's make it again. For many years, I always thought that the rapture of the church was the event that, that started the last seven-year period. I've told you that. And I've, and I've asked multiple people on multiple occasions if you could give me just a scripture that would show that, right? What I have found is this, is that undoubtedly, according to Daniel chapter 9, the event that starts the last seven-year period, whether we know somebody's going to sign an agreement or not, we're told in Daniel 9, without a doubt, that the event that starts the last seven-year period is the signing of an agreement, okay? Now, whether or not we want to call it a signing of a peace treaty with Israel, I believe that's what it is. Why do you believe that? Because the whole chapter that was spoken to Daniel had to do with Israel. All right. So a signing of an agreement with the Antichrist, that's what it tells us in Daniel 9, that is the Antichrist. And he signs the agreement with, I believe it's the children of Israel. Okay. And besides that, an agreement start up again and then the sacrifices are stopped. So all this is interconnected with that. So the event that starts the last seven year period, I can tell you definitely it coincides with the signing of this agreement. And you can find that in one verse in the Bible. I think it's Daniel chapter nine, maybe verse 27. So where the Antichrist signs that agreement, that begins. And then you know what it says also in the same verse? In the middle of it, he breaks it. In the middle of that seven, that last seven year period, the Antichrist, the one that represents Satan on earth, just like Jesus represented the father on earth for three and a half years and performed his ministry. These Antichrist will represent Satan on earth and for three and a half years he will bring deception. All right. And so he said, Paul says that this blindness is in part until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. When that last Gentile is saved, amen, then that, then that work is done. Now, I used to think that this was directly connected to the rapture. And listen, I'm not smart enough to tell you for sure whether it is or not. Last Gentile to get saved, his name was, I don't even know why I thought of Brian. Brian Henderson in Lafayette, Louisiana, on this night, bumped into so-and-so on the streets on Simcoe. And after a life of misery... He was given a track about Jesus. And when he opened it up, he said, all this I did for you. And he said, Jesus. And his heart got saved. Hallelujah. And that was the last one right there. Bam. I'm just saying. And, and, then, and then now that was the fullness of the Gentiles. And now the end is coming in. All right. So however, we're going to break that down. But there's going to be a day whenever the end of the, the fullness of the Gentiles takes place. Now, I do want you to know when we transition to chapter 11. We're going to see that the Gentiles are known as desecrating the temple. Like they're trotting underfoot. And we understand that when the Antichrist comes, even if we, we may not be completely in agreement, some of us may say, oh no, the Antichrist has to be full Jew. Some people may say he may be half Jew, half not. Some people say that he's not a Jew at all, that he's a Gentile. Whether or not we believe that he's a Jew or a Gentile or half or whatever, we have to be at least able to agree that he's going to also have all kinds of nations that are working with him because yeah. the Bible tells us that. And that they're going to overrun, the Gentiles are going to overrun that city. So there's coming a day when that's not going to happen anymore. All right, look at Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he began to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. So what I'm trying to say is, is that this seventh trumpet, I believe coinciding with the seventh Bible, <laughs> signals the end of the seven year period, signals the end of time as we know it, and signals the timing of the end of the Gentile era, whenever God brings it all to an end, and he begins to now usher in the new heaven and the new earth, and the thousand year or the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. And that begins a whole new time. Frame. All right. Now this real quick, I, I, I built this little thing to try to help you understand where I'm coming from, whether you agree with it or not. And I added to it. All right. And so I wanted you to see this before we go into these last couple of scripture slides. So I made this little graphic and this is describing the last seven year period, the way, the way that I am interpreting it. Okay, and so this is a seven-year period, and 
this seven-year period is broken up into 3.5 years, right? And the, the, this, this 3.5 years, this first 3.5 years is broken up into these seals. And the seals are seal one, if I'm shooting from the hip, the rider on the white horse, which represents the Antichrist. Seal number two was the rider on the red horse, which represents war. Seal number three was the rider on the black horse, which represents famine. And then seal number four was the rider on a pale or a green horse, which represents death. Seal number five was the martyrs of God's people. Seal number six, uh, uh, seal number six doesn't happen yet. There's a 75 day period. You remember that we talked about Daniel? And this is, again, this is my interpretation. I'm not trying to like, you need to go study for yourself. There's a 1335 number that's in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. And, it, and he's saying that blessed is he that comes to the 1335 days. And what that, and what I'm trying to say is if you subtract if you subtract the, the time frame from the uh, 1335, if you subtract 1260, I know this is kind of complicated, 1260 is half of seven. 1260 days is half of seven years. Okay. And so if you, if you take the 1260 and you, add, and you add and you subtract it from 1335, it gives you 75. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? You mean we're riding on the blackboard? You all got that. Okay, you got you got 1,335 days in Daniel, and Daniel in chapter 12 says, "Blessed is he that makes it or believes and makes it to the 1,335 days." Half of half of seven years is 1,260 days. If you take 1,335 and you subtract 1,260, you end up with 75. So what I'm trying to say is is that the 75 day period is between seal number five seal number six and it's before uh it's before well it's really supposed to be between seal six and seal seven i believe now i'm really getting confusing in the united states seal number between seal number six right it's the day of the lord it's the sun become this is seal number six actually up there you see that the the sun's becoming dark the moon's becoming blood and it's after the 75 days of great tribulation the rapture of the church is what I'm putting here is taking place. All right. Now here, this is talking about wrath. All right. So this is the wrath. Now this is where we're getting to. And I want you to see, I'm going to hustle up. I'm just going to go ahead and go through here. This is trumpet one. This is vile one. This is trumpet two. This is vile two. All right. You see what I'm doing here? I'm just trying to show you that I'm believing that the trumpets and the vials are happening concurrently and that it's not all seven trumpets happen and then all seven vials happen and the reason i'm making a big deal about this is because i was never taught this way before okay i was always taught that it was the seals then the trumpets and then the vials all right so i'm trying to give you this information so that you can understand what i'm trying to tell you because i know that there's a lot of information here and that it's kind of confusing i get that Good. probably because i'm doing a poor job of explaining it. all right so you ready so we're almost there y'all hang with me so you see what I'm saying? Trumpet one, vial one. Trumpet two, vial two. Trumpet three, vial three. Trumpet four, vial four. You get the point. And so a trumpet, could it be that in, in the heavenly realm, an angel's blowing a trumpet, and then another angel's pouring out a vial. Another angel's blowing a trumpet, and another angel's pouring out a vial. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now, when we go to these next scriptures, I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's, it's probably trumpet one and vial one, and maybe... Maybe five and vial five. They don't seem to really completely coincide exactly. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to pretend that they do. But what I want you to. But I want you to see the similarities between the trumpets and the vials side by side. And then I want you to make a decision for yourself if what I'm trying to tell you makes sense. All right. So here we go. This is Revelation 16:2, and it's talking about the vials. The first went and it poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. I probably lost you somewhere along the way. If I happen, something bad happens to me and I can't make it back next week, and you don't catch anything else, and you're not a believer tonight, 
and, and life goes on a little bit longer and all of a sudden they start telling you to pledge your allegiance to a new world in a new way and they tell you in order for you to do that you got to get this and you got to take this mark or whatever don't don't do that my friend don't don't take a mark in your right hand or your forehead don't pledge your allegiance to some other system no you're only supposed to pledge your allegiance to Jesus and the reason that you were created was for you to be able to honor God through a relationship with Jesus. Not for you to become a heart surgeon. Not for you to drive a BMW. Not for you to have five kids in a white picket fence. No. Your purpose on this earth was to make a decision with his son. Don't take the mark. I said it. Don't take the mark. Alright. Here we go. Revelation 8, 7. The first angel sounded. There followed hail, fire, mingled with blood. They were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burned up and all green grass was burned up. Well, how you get that these two right here are not living soul died in the sea look at this revelation 8 8 and the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood revelation 16 4 the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains and waters and they became blood Revelation 8, 10, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. It fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains and the water. Fresh water, last time, salt water. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now, I the, the connection here is directly connected to the sun. And I, and I agree in, in the fourth trumpet is the sun becomes darkened but i do want to say that there's the possibility right i mean I'm, again i'm just saying th that there's the possibility that there could be like some type of a solar burst first that burns people up but i just want you to see that there's a direct connection between the two it, it appears to me of the talking of the sun and the talking of, of i'm sorry of the vials and the trumpets and here it says, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. All right, here we go. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. I noticed the darkness here, but not only that, there's like some major pain going on, right? Well, this, uh, the trumpet, this was trumpet number five. He says he opened the bottomless pit. Smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Do y'all remember what came up out of the, out of the pit that was descriptive of the smoke? It was those demon spirits. Do you remember that? Those locusts that had the crowd. And so the whole sky became darkened whenever this was opened up and so you see the connection and I wanted to point that out because you remember what, what happened with those uh, those locusts what did they do they had the stinger of a scorpion you remember that and they were they were pop they were hitting people and what was happening they for five months they would be in excruciating pain right and they would want to die and they couldn't die could you imagine that being in so much pain I mean just a toothache dude I've talked to three pe two people this week that had a toothache and back I'm telling you right now, I remember I was waiting to do an adjustment meeting. Actually, it was on Ryan's. It was one of yours. And I was, and I cracked a tooth. And dude, that thing, while I was sitting there waiting for the adjustment, I, like, I called up my dentist. I'm like, dude, you got to get me in. Thank God I was already established with a dentist. And he got me in and they ended up pulling my tooth. It was fractured all the way to the nerve. I'm just trying to make a point. Just a toothache. I don't, I think I'm going to handle pain pretty good. I don't want to handle that pain. It didn't even get bad. I wasn't handling that pain well at all. But could you imagine being stung by a scorpion the next thing you know for five months you were in so much pain you want to die and you can't die? That is not fun, my friend. They gnawed their tongues for pain. So I just wanted you to see those two connections because I didn't have the whole <coughs> scripture there. So darkness connects them and I believe that pain could be connected. Revelation 16, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. The water thereof was dried up of the east might be prepared. I thought this was interesting. Trumpet number six, the angel which had the trumpet says, loose the four angels which are bound at the great river Euphrates. So we see the connection between the Euphrates River. And then really, if you go back and you read Revelations, I mean, I'm 
right at the bile seven, this is this is a pretty powerful one. I mean, each one of them is made up of three whole verses. I couldn't fit it all on here, but look, the seventh angel sounded, and in Re that's what it says in verse 15, but look at verse uh, in 19. I'm going to just read it to you. The temple of God was opened in heaven. There was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. All right, here we go. This is trumpet number seven right here. I'm sorry, this is vial number seven. That was trumpet number seven I just described to you. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. Now, to me, I'm just being honest. The more I see that, the more I see the connection, it's becoming more and more hard for me not to believe that the trumpets and the vials are actually happening one with the other, okay? And again, that's, that's my opinion and that's what I'm seeing there. So listen, we're just gonna go to the Lord in prayer. Aren't you glad that you won't have to be here for the rest of God? Amen. Amen. Yeah. And all you got to do is receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you got to mean it. Yeah. It's not like something you can really just try to talk somebody into, you know? Right. Jesus said you got to count the cost. Amen. It's got to be a heart thing. Praise God. You know, when you hear the gospel for the first time, you might not know what to think about. But I, but I want to encourage you to know <laughs> that, listen, if you'll keep coming back. If something stimulated your heart tonight at all. If at any point in time, God got your attention, right? I'm just saying, I don't know. Do you want video? If at any point in time, God got your attention with something that was said and you felt a little something there, I'm telling you right now what that is. You might not have ever felt it before, but it's the Lord trying to talk to you. It's the Lord trying to get your attention. And you got one of two choices. You can harden your heart towards what God said, or you can soften your heart toward, towards what God wants to say to you. Amen. And softening your heart towards God starts with a simple prayer. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me, if you're at home watching the video, just bow your heads. And if you felt what I was talking about and you want to try to soften your heart towards the Lord because you believe that, that, that you desire to know whether he's real or not, I'm telling you right now, he will reveal himself to you if you will allow him to do it. He wants to reveal himself to you, but you got to soften your heart a little bit. The Bible says that he resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. If you walk, if we walk around with a heart that says, God, I don't believe you. I don't believe in you. I don't believe there's any way you could be real. But if you're willing to at least take a little bit of a step and to say, okay, God, if you're real, reveal yourself. Show me. Show me that you're real. And I guarantee you that if you'll say that and mean it, he will do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up every person that's going to hear this message or every person that was in this place. I pray that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would begin to draw them into your presence, draw them towards you, Lord. Right now, if you might be watching on video or might even be in this place, you would say, you know what? No, I've already heard enough. I've already heard enough, preacher. I I'm convinced that God is real and that he sent Jesus right now. And all you have to do is listen. Back in the day, I ran up to the altar. I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit started dealing with my heart. My heart was beating out of my chest. I ran up to the altar. I'm telling you, you can do business with God right where you are. You can invite Jesus in. You can say, Lord, I want to know you. If this story is true, that you would die for me on a cross so that you can teach me your way. If you prayed that prayer, I'm telling you right now, your life will never be the same. Father, right now, I pray for each and every person that may have prayed that prayer. Lord, that you would do a work on the inside of their hearts and that you would change them, Lord, and that you would draw them to your presence, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, for the rest